Good afternoon. Um, my name is Wanibe Jessica, and I'm from African Center of Excellence for Genomics of Infectious Diseases in Ridimas University. And I'll be talking about how we can use Sherlock to detect Lassa virus in Nigeria. It's a CRISPR-based technology. But before I move ahead to tell you how we use Sherlock in detection of Lassa virus, I'll briefly want to talk about um, genomic revolution in Nigeria, especially in the um, infectious diseases and how our lab is in the forefront in this revolution. Since the Human Genome Project, we've seen a change in the way we approach healthcare and research. And this has helped in the way we diagnose different diseases, especially genetic diseases. And this has also changed the way we carry out this research, especially in the revolution of the technologies being used to detect these genes. Um, this benefit most times have been translated into surveillance of diseases and also understanding infectious diseases. But this benefit have not been seen in most African countries whereby we still see samples being sent outside the continent for diagnosis. We still see African researchers interested in genomic research, leaving the continents, leaving the country for um, better opportunities outside there. And even those that go out to study genomics, when they come back, they don't see a platform where they can practice genomic research. This raised a lot of concern among some African scientists, which actually um, gave birth to ASGID. ASGID is um, a consortium of um, local and international partners. So our local partners are um, universities in Senegal, in um, Senegal, um, Kenema Government Hospital in Sierra Leone, and also Ira Teaching Hospital located in Nigeria, and the ASGID headquarters is in Ridimas University. Some of our international partners are the Bird Institute, Harvard University, Tulane University, some international companies as Illumina and Cogenics. So um, some of our recent collaborators are the Stanford University, um, US Department of Defense, University of ne Nebraska, University of Cambridge, and University of Edinburgh. Our mandate, the aim or the goal of ASGED is to be able to create a platform whereby African scientists, especially young African scientists, can carry out genomic research. And whereby they can be equipped with genomic tools to be able to use this in the control of outbreaks in Africa, not necessarily transporting our samples outside Africa to be able to solve these issues. Also, to engage communities in prevention efforts and public health sponsored activities and education. ASGID is divided into two branches. We have the educational aspect and the research aspect. So the educational aspect focuses on graduate programs, whereby you have a platform for master's degree and PhD degrees for molecular biology and infectious diseases, and also on-site training workshop, whereby you go out to train um, laboratory scientists in different hospitals on how to use molecular techniques in the detection of um, diseases in Nigeria. Also, we have partnered programs with different institutions, like that of Senegal and that of um, um, Sierra Leone as well, whereby we go there to train them and they come over also for trainings in genomic research. Then the research aspect is based on, based on metagenomic research. That is focused on using metagenomic, metagenomic approach to be able to detect fever of a known origin. So in Africa, majorly when you come down with fever, the first diagnosis the doctor will give you is that either you have malaria or you have typhoid. But in most cases, it's not that. So and we, in ASGID, we are trying to use the metagenomic, ap metagenomic approach to be able to find out what are the other causes of fever, except malaria and typhoid. Also, we have a sample collection network whereby we have different um, hospitals, whereby when they send in samples, we, carry out, we, we study more on how to identify all these unknown um, pathogens of, of fever. And also, we have the bio bioinformatic platforms whereby, after we sequence this, um, sequence this samples, we have the bioinformatic samples to be able to make sense of this data actually here in, oh, sorry, um, present in Nigeria. So whereby we don't have to send some of our data to be analyzed outside the country, but we analyze those data in Nigeria. 
So when you have the merge of your of research and education, you build a genomic capacity in Nigeria, whereby we have genomic sequencing and sequencing labs, which are, we have established in um, two sentinel sites in Nigeria, one in Edo State, which is an endemic site for Lassa fever, and the other at Ondo State, also endemic for Lassa fever. Then we have diagnostic core facility, which also does place itself a diagnostic core facility, whereby when people come in with fever and it's not malaria or typhoid, since they're endemic for Lassa, the next action is to check for um, Lassa fever. And where, when they notice that they have Lassa fever, they can be given drugs to be able to um, treat the, the patient. So we have sustainable sci um, science um, careers, whereby you have um, researchers or Nigerian researchers that have gone out to study genomes coming back to actually apply and grow their career in this field in Nigeria. Some of our research impact. Although um, since the inception of ASGID, we've been in the forefront in most of the viral outbreaks in Nigeria, helping in the control and the detection of some of these viruses. One of those cases is that of the Ebola outbreak in 2014. I guess we can remember that period when most of West African countries were, have, were coming down with Ebola, and it was really crazy and scary. So at first, when we had the first um, index patient coming into Nigeria with um, the virus, at that point, we didn't know what was going on. And um, God bless um, late Dr. Adedevo for our efforts of keeping the patient zero in the hospital and not allowing the patient to leave. So that helped ASGATE to be able to detect and confirm that actually what this patient had was actually Ebola, even though the doctor was suspecting. But by just confirming that this is Ebola, prompted contact tracing because we had a lot of doctors and nurses that came in contact and even drivers and some, patients and some individuals in the plane that came in contact with this particular patient before the patient got to the hospital. And also, I want to talk briefly about how we were able to um, contain the yellow fever outbreak in 2000, late 2018. So the story behind this yellow fever outbreak was that it came, we had um, people with fever coming in because people with fever coming in um, to the hospital in Edo State. And Edo State is known to be endemic for Lassa fever. So after carrying out diagnosis, proper diagnosis, okay, maybe they have Lassa. There was no Lassa, it was negative. And this caused a lot of concern among doctors. Okay, so what is causing this? People are dying, what's the issue? So they sent some of the samples to our lab to carry metagenomic sequencing. And after subjecting it to metagenomic sequencing, we realized that most of the patients had yellow fever rates, meaning that they were positive for yellow fever. And this prompted the Nigerian Center for Disease Control to call an outbreak of yellow fever in Edo State and also creating the mass vaccination of people in Edo State. And this was done within four days, increasing the turnaround time. So imagine if we had to send these samples outside the country to actually detect if they had yellow fever or not. Would I have a lot of people dying because of yellow fever before we can even get the, um, the result? So also for Lassa fever virus, ASGIT has been in the forefront since 2013 in the surveillance and the detection of Lassa and the control also of Lassa fever virus in Nigeria. Lassa fever, before ASGIT came in, in Edo State, we had issues of people dying of Lassa. No cure, no um, infrastructure put in place to be able to detect these viruses on time. But since ASGIT came in, a, a proper structure has been put in place, whereby you see people coming. We had, because then they had increased rates of technicians, doctors coming down and dying because of Lassa virus. Well, since the came we have the decreased rates of technicians and um, nurses dying of Lassa virus, and we've seen the prompt um, diagnosis of this um, Lassa virus. Because for Lassa virus, I guess most of us don't know, is a, is a hemorrhagic fever just like Ebola. It's just not as severe as Ebola. And it has um, a drug known as Uravrain. When taken early in, the, early in the infection, can treat that person from Lassa fever. So, since the inception of ASG, this has been able to be implemented, whereby when patients come in and they are being diagnosed with Lassa early, they can take ribavirin and actually get well from Lassa um, fever, not all necessarily dying from it. Although this is not always the case anyway, in most times, because before some of them get there, they might have, the virus might have spread so much that even the ribavirin cannot work on them. 
But with all this, this raised a particular question, especially for Lassa fever diagnosis in Ira Teaching Hospital, which is our, cent our main site for Lassa fever research. We realized that most communities are far away from the hospital itself. And the time it would take for them to send samples or the patient to come down, it's, by that time they would have, should I say, they would have died of the uh, disease, or it might be too late for them to actually take that particular rebarbering. And we realized that we're based on our paper that we published in 2018, the New England Journal paper. It talks about the, we realized an increase in the last of fever cases in 2018, not necessarily because of the virulence of the pathogen or anything, but because we realized that the awareness of last of fever virus, last of fever in Edo State increased, prompting people to come to the clinic to receive treatment because they realized that if you come early, you can take your brain and you'll be, you'll, be, you'll be cured. But we realized that for them to get to this place, it would take time. And the workload on the laboratory technicians, the nurses was too much. And this posed the question that how can we be able to reduce this workload? How can we solve this issue? How can we tackle this problem? What if we have a possibility whereby we can all take, we can all carry out lots of fever diagnosis within these communities, not necessarily all of them coming to a real teaching hospital, which brings us to the use of Sherlock. Sherlock, before I go into Sherlock in details, I just want to give us an overview of the whole process. So in molecular biology or in our lab, usually for us to detect a particular pathogen, we have different steps you have to take. You have the extraction step, which you use um, kits, kiagen kits or zymo kit, depending on which one you use in your lab. And you have the polymerase chain reaction step, whereby you have to amplify your DNA so that you'll be able to detect. Then you have your detection step, whereby you use the gel electrophoresis or you when you're using your qpcr you can see the fluorescence or the art the ct on the screen so but if we were to deploy this process to the field we know that is impossible because one you need a lot of equipment you need light you need technical expertise to be able to deploy this to the field during outbreak sherlock is should i say a deployable step or a deployable technique that comprises of all the step that you can be used that can be used on the field so the Hudson step stands, which I'll explain in details later, serves for the extraction step. Whereby the RPA stands for the PCR amplification step. The Cas13A stands for the detection step. And you have your results readout, whereby you can use the light cycler or the lateral flow, whereby you can visualize that um, without using any machine, basically. So Hudson, Hudson was designed, Hudson known as the heated or uh, heating on extract diagnostic samples to obliterate nucleases, was designed in Sabeti lab by Katrin and Cameron. So the whole idea is to be able to extract our nucleic acid without using any sophisticated kit. And this, uh, this can be done on the field. And some of the samples we use in the Hudson step are the from, whereby you can extract your nucleic acid is from plasma, urine, and saliva. How does the Hudson step work? So when you have your clinical sample, we treat this clinical sample with TCEP and EDTA. TCEP helps in the um, inactivation of your nucleic acid, and your EDTA helps to, um, um, how do I put it? The EDTA helps to chelate your nucleic acid, preventing it from degradation, basically. So, and we have different conditions whereby we subject or enhance the inactivation and um, viral, um, the nucleus inactivation and viral inactivation of our samples. So the first step is the subjection of the clinical sample to five, um, 37 to 50 degrees Celsius for 20 minutes. This helps to inactivate your nucleases. Then the second part is to be able to inactivate your viral particle by subjecting your sample to 95 degrees for five minutes. After which, the, uh, whatever products you have in this particular step is now taken into the RPA step. These are used as templates. Now you have your extracted nucleic acid in this mix, whereby you can use that as a template for your um, RPA, which stands for your recombinant polymerase amplification. So Sherlock was designed by Jonathan and Cameron and Omar in Feng Zhang's lab at the Broad Institute. And Sherlock stands for specific high sensitivity Enzymatic reporter unlocking, and it's a CRISPR-based technology which uses Cas13A, as Anna earlier pointed out. Cas13A is 
specific for RNA targeting. So it targets only single-stranded RNA, not DNA. And we use this to be able to detect RNA viruses in samples. And um, the Shellox consists of two major steps. We have the RPA and the castetin A detection step. How does this work? So the RPA, you, the RPA step, like I earlier said, is more like your polymerase um, amplification step, whereby you have either your single-stranded RNA or your double-stranded DNA. This step is just to amplify whatever you have, your target sequence in the mix. Whereby you have the, um, you have your, for the RNA, you convert them to RT, you use the RT RPA, whereby it converts it to DNA, and your RPA for uh, double-stranded DNA just amplifies your nucleic acid. Whatever amplicon you have in this RPA step is taken to the Cas13 detection step. And what makes this different from the normal PCR? This step is isothermal, whereby you use only one condition for amplification, unlike your PCR step where you have three different conditions or four different conditions, but this only use one particular temperature to amplify your nucleic acid. When, it's, when you use, um, when the amplicon from here are taken to the Cas13, are taken for the Cas13 A detection, you have your T7 transcript, which is very important because we know that Cas13 A is specific for RNA detection, um, target only RNA sequences. Your T7 helps transcribe your DNA to single-stranded RNA. This will now allow the guide RNA, which are specific for your target sequence, to by interleaving with your Cas13 A, where to cleave. And we all know that, um, like. The concern being raised about CRISPR is that they have a non-specific um, RNA activity, whereby they cleave non-specifically. And this has been harnessed in the detection of um, viruses in Sherlock, whereby when your Cas13 A is activated and it cleaves your target site, we have non-specific cleavage. And this cleaves your reporters present in your medium, because we add um, the lateral flow probe reporter depending on which medium you're going to use to be able to visualize your results. And when this cleaves your reporter, you have the release of signals. And this is specific when you want to use the light circular to view your results. Now, how for the lateral flow readout, this is a different, um, t a different um, form of uh, visualization of your results entirely whereby you have your reporter, which is made up of your farm, dye, and your biotin, uh, your biotin which are known as, the, uh, known as the lateral flow probe. So what happens is that during the castetin detection, when your castetin cleaves, non specifically, it cleaves your biotin and your farm dye. When it cleaves your biotin, your biotin binds to the streptavidin line, whereas your um, farm that binds to the antibody capture line. But when you don't have a cleavage of this um, two complex, known as your, your lateral flow probe, you have only the biotin, which is still attached to the farm dye, binding to the streptide within dye. For you to be able to detect which is positive or negative, because this figure just shows basically an illustration of how it works. For your positive band, when it cleaves your biotin, you have your farm dye binding specifically to the antibody. You don't have any lights or any fluorescent being shown on the strip. But when it binds, when it doesn't cleave your biotin and your farm complex, you have it being stopped at the streptavidin band giving you a negative result. But there are cases whereby we have both the negative band and the positive band showing. At that point, we know that there is no, that we have not enough viral copies in that particular sample. That way we'll be able to say, okay, maybe the viral copies are not enough. That is why we don't have enough cleavage of your biotin and your farm complex. That is when you can see a band on the negative side and a band on the positive side. This is just a, a flow chart or a flow on how the whole process works, whereby you have your hosting step serving as your extraction process, which moves to your amplification, your RTRPA, and your detection step, where you have your T7 polymerase and your Cas13 detection step. Then your readout, as I earlier said, we have the two 
form of real doubt, we have the life cycle and the lateral flow. The lateral flow makes it more feel deployable during outbreaks because we can carry our life cycle to the field. For Sherlock, we have tested these on lots of positive samples for plasma. The next step is to move to saliva and urine and see how if we'll be able to get the same result that we're getting in plasma positive samples. Some of the benefits. After um, testing, using this um, technique in the detection of LASA in our lab, we realized that this um, instrument is actually field deployable. It's something that we can carry out to the lab, to the, to the field during outbreaks. And we notice that the use of multiple guides is far better than using single guide because Lassa fever virus is very diverse and it has different clades. And to be able to capture all those clades, you need different guides that can be able to target different positions of different clades. Then we have the Sherlock assay as the potential, has the potential also to detect Lassa virus in other body fluids, like I earlier said, in, plasma, in um, saliva and urine. Some of the challenges. I won't lie to you, this might seem all perfect and straightforward, but why subjecting this to in the lab? We realized that the Hudson step gave us a lot of issues. So for the RPA and the Sherlock detection step, when you extract your nucleic acid using kiagene kit or any extraction kit, you tend to notice that from the RPA to the um, Sherlock step, they come out positive. But when you subject those same samples, the plasma samples, to Hudson, we rarely get a result. We rarely get positive results. This is to say that we still have some optimization to do in the Hudson step in particular. What does the future hold for Sherlock? So this can be employed not only in Lassa fever diagnostics or detection. This has been employed also in Dengue detection and Zika detection, which has been working fine. And also it can be employed to other form of infectious diseases or non-infectious diseases. And we can also use this in monitoring multi-drug resistance, especially in our country whereby we have different, uh, we are having strains of multiple drug resistant bacteria. Also in the, whereby you can detect the transcript to enable better and faster control of um, diseases of multi-drug resistance spread in the country. I want to um, acknowledge uh, my team, ASGID Lab, for their support and also our partners, the NCDC, the Broad Institute, Tulane University, University of Cambridge, and our funders, History Africa, and IH World Bank, which are the major sponsors of the ASGID lab itself, and also CEPI grant and BBSRC. Thank you very much.